did in their use of the Old Testament, when you stop and think about it, they demonstrated how Jesus was and is the Messiah of Abrahamic promise and penitent prophetic hope by pulling passages from all over the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, to make their case. They picked relative texts and, and linked them together to demonstrate the truth of Jesus' claims. And so we learn from the apostles themselves that we are going to necessarily systematize the Bible. That systematization is necessary at all is a function of the Bible's form. The Bible comes to us not as a manual arranged topically, but as an anthology presented primarily in, in forms like historical narrative and poetic expression and situational letters and apocalyptic visions. It has all manner of variety of language, genre, embedded cultural assumptions, expressions, and forms. It represents various and different historical periods and perspectives. And all of these things are put together into one book, one giant anthology, that beckons for some sort of systemization as we try to live out its teaching. No preacher gets up on Sunday morning and says, please turn in your Bibles to the fourth book of baptism, chapter 6. It's not what we do. If we're going to talk about baptism, we're going to talk about any topic, we are going to pull from around the biblical canon. We are going to, in the word, systematize. But that reality also presents the challenge of the situation. The challenge is that once we begin to exercise our own powers of discernment on the biblical text, we run the risk of falling into error. And so perhaps the question would better be rephrased, not so much should we, but how can we? systematized biblical teaching because, as I think most of you are well aware, church history is rife with the perils of systemization run amok, where theological systems uh, become uh, as authoritative as the biblical text itself for many people who claim to be Christians over the centuries. The danger of systemization that we learn from history is that though it is necessary and inevitable, over time systemization has a habit of becoming a tradition or becoming a creed, or becoming an authoritative rubric that can more and more stand on its own authority without scriptural support. You move from systemization for the sake of teaching or understanding what the Bible says to systemization for its own sake, and, and then to systemization for the sake of maintaining the system that's been handed down to you. The important thing to remember in all of this is that systemization that necessarily follows from Bible study does not, does not uh, quickly become a, a theological system like Calvinism or Wesleyanism or, or, or some such thing. It doesn't happen quickly. It happens slowly over time. And like the proverbial frogs in the boiling pot, those who have uh, allowed inevitable systemization to, becoming, to become a functioning systematic theology often don't realize that they have been co-opted by something that has authority outside the Bible. And one further opening observation, the danger of an unconscious systematic theology having more sway over our thinking and our beliefs than we realize it is important to understand because it doesn't necessarily mean, or our system, our system is not necessarily doctrinally incorrect. The problem is that it has authority that it does not deserve. And so in one sense, that's my lecture in a nutshell. Yes, we have to do it, but boy, we better be careful. Well, I want to do in the last few minutes, or, or the remaining of the time that I have this morning, I want to unpack a little bit of, of what it means to say, yes, we have to. And even if our system is doctrinally correct, it's still functionally wrong. And so let me start by just redefining the word theology itself for us. Well, theology is a dirty word to many people. It does not mean the same thing to different people, nor in different contexts. Theology, at its root, is really just talking or writing or thinking, communicating about God. Literally, theology is just God speak or God talk. And it is in that sense that theology is inevitable. Every Bible class, every sermon, every bulletin article, every Bible class workbook you use is theological. It is somebody's pulling passages together. It is somebody's, somebody's articulating their understanding of the biblical text. And so it is inherently, if not informally, theological. It is speaking of God. We are speaking about God to each other. And so we read the Bible, and then we proceed to discuss it, to teach it, to sermonize on it, to make applications from it, to write about it. And it is all talking about God on the basis of Scripture. It is, uh, with a little t, theological. 
And so that's why I like to call them formal theology. We are simply taking the text of Scripture, and we are trying to understand it better and communicate with others about it. We are trying to make the job of understanding how the principles involved in, say, Paul's discussions of meat sacrificed to idols in 1 Corinthians translate into a culture in which we eat a lot of meat but don't have idols to worry about. How is that passage relevant? Well, we talk about that with each other, but making that jump from what Scripture says to even how we apply it. There's a mental process involved there, and that's where things can go awry, sometimes without us even realizing it. And so informal theological talk, God talk, it's going to happen. We're going to pull passages together. We're going to try to make sense of baptism or the Lord's Supper or local congregational autonomy or what the work of the local church is. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. And we're going to talk to each other about Scripture. That's what I mean by informal theology. But in the larger religious world, as you're, I think, probably well aware, there is a more formal sense in which the word theology is used as well, particularly in academia and in the denominational realm. And there are several categories of, of, of theology out there in that wider world. There's historical theology. That's the study of the history of doctrinal and theological development among self-professed Christian groups over the centuries, particularly the earliest centuries after Jesus and the apostles, what the so-called church fathers wrote and believed and practiced. And historical theology as a discipline is more, in one sense, historical than theological. In other words, what's going on in historic, the study of historical theology is just more about describing what these people believed rather than prescribing what we should believe today. Though many students of historical theology do study it for the purpose of better informing their own views of what they should believe today. And so there's historical theology, the study of what people in the past believed about the Bible. But then there's systematic theology. That's the formal attempt to insert the Bible's situationally arranged teaching. It's, it, it, it's, it's setting as 66 books. The different genres of literature in that book, prose versus poetry and so forth. The various historical settings, ancient Near East, Greco-Roman Mediterranean world. To set all of these, these, these pieces into a topical, often propositional, logical, structured framework. And so we're going to take the Bible and we're going to drop it through a sieve. We're going to attempt to shuck the Bible's form as it's come to us in, in, in this book from God. We're going to shuck that form off to lay bare in more accessible form the doctrinal content. Now, and one says, to be fair again, this is what we do. When we, when we, how often do we try to read the Bible ourselves and we say, or we have someone say to us, I, I'm really not worried about all this other stuff, just tell me what I have to do to be saved. Just pull the pieces out, shuck the rest of it away, and, and, and just tell me what I need to know to be saved. So what happens in systematic theology is, in, in, in classical systematic theology, there are several, usually about seven, classic categories. There's theology proper. That's, where, that's the doctrine of God itself, the doctrine of the Trinity, and things like this. Christology, the, uh, the, the person and nature of Jesus. There's soteriology. That's how God saves us and what we need to do to be saved. There's pneumatology, what the Bible says about the Spirit. There's ecclesiology, what does the Bible say about the church. There's eschatology, what does the Bible say about the last things, how the world's going to end and what comes after that. And then there's ethics. How then should we live? What's moral and what's not? And so, and so you filter the Bible through these categories to determine what the Bible's teaching is. We shuck away the, the form it comes to us in, and now we can tell you what the Bible says about God, what the Bible says about salvation, what the Bible says about the church. The problem is that in academia and in the religious denominational world, these systematic approaches tend to become philosophical and abstract. Or in seminaries, they tend to become too prescriptive. We are Reformed here. We are Wesleyan here. And, and, and so we putatively begin to force text into the system, interpreting text according to the preconceived system, rather than adapting the system to the biblical text. I remember years ago when I was taking a class at a Reformed seminary, and we were taking a class on the, uh, the class on the book of Hebrews. And we got to Hebrews chapter 6, and there's some strong language in there about falling away. And it's a Reformed Calvinist seminary. And I remember the professor at the beginning of that class saying, I know what this passage looks like, but let me tell you how, it's going to, you know, how, how we're still Calvinists, basically. The system begins to have an authority, a power over the text itself. That's the danger of systematic theology.
even though it's necessary at some informal level. So that's the paradox, that at some level systemization is necessary. The New Testament does not come with this teaching arranged in categories like church, baptism, Lord's Supper, church discipline, all these things. Instead, what we have is Gospels, Acts, story of Jesus, letters of Paul. And we have to do the work of discerning what the whole counsel of God is in regard to how to be saved or what the work of the local church is. And so the challenge for us is to systematize, yes, but to not allow this our own systemization to take on a life of its own or to devolve into a proof-texted understanding of the will of God. I know verses about baptism in Romans, but if I have no idea about what the overall point of the letter of Romans as a whole is about, I'm starting to slide into more systematic thinking than scriptural thinking. The third category I'd give you quickly, is, 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 or a third type of theology, as, as, as that terminology is often used today, is biblical theology. Biblical theology. There was a biblical theology movement in, in academic and denominational circles in the mid-20th century, and that's not what I'm talking about here for those who keep score at home and, and are aware of such things. I'm more using that term in terms of the recent evangelical emphasis upon what they are using that term for now, biblical theology. The idea is that the Bible itself, it does need to be systematized, but rather than imposing categories, doctrine of God, doctrine of Christ, uh, doctrine of the Spirit, doctrine of the Church, rather than imposing uh, kind of categories on the text, we're going to allow the text to give us what the categories are. Themes that the Bible works all the way across its body. Themes like covenant, redemption. Israel, that clever way that Israel morphs from Old Testament Israel of the flesh to New Testament Israel of the spirit. That's a theme. The people of God are always Israel all the way across. But we're going to get the categories. Messiah, prophet, priest, king, all anointed ones. All of them summed up in Jesus, who himself was personified in David. That, that messianic theme that runs all the way through. Kingdom. We're going to allow the Bible to give us the categories that we need to think in terms of. We're going to study in terms of. Let the Bible set the tone and the terms for how and what we're going to systematize. Rather than coming to the, in other words, rather than coming to the Bible with our questions and forcing the Bible to answer our questions, we're going to let the Bible set the agenda and read accordingly. So the danger is when necessarily wrestling with the Bible in systemic ways, when that gets hardened into a creedal or doctrinal system. When the informal becomes hardened into formal theology, when authoritative theological systems become something that we profess allegiance to. Have you ever heard somebody refer to themselves as a church of Christer? We're not immune to these forces, ladies and gentlemen. We're not immune to it. Over the time, the mass of God talk amongst us begins to build up into a form of formal theological works. Commentaries that we rely way too much on. Commentaries are good when used rightly. Commentaries become a crutch too often. But it's not just that kind of stuff. Favorite sermons that we've heard from our favorite preachers that become the authoritative interpretation of a passage that we refer people back to when people ask us about something. We can't talk from Scripture ourselves. We say, well, it's what Brother So-and-So said. You should go listen to that sermon. Or papers or articles that, we've been, that we found insightful to the point that we read them with greater attention for understanding what the Bible means than reading the Bible itself. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, is not the things themselves. There's nothing against commentaries, sermons, bulletins, papers, any of that. The problem is that we too, maybe more often than we realize, begin to ascribe authority to these things. And the slow process of an authoritative systematic theology developing even among us begins to set in without us realizing it. In one sense, I think we're all well aware of the pitfall and the danger. But let's talk a little bit more about how Scripture itself thinks about informal theology, what I've called informal theology. Scripture itself reminds us that while the Word of God is the sole authority, God always intended Scripture to generate conversation, God talk, informal theology among His people. And He always intended His people would share their wisdom gained by experience of living His will with each other. And so the, the patterns there all over the Bible. Nehemiah chapter 8, Ezra and his associates are back from exile with the people. And they not only read the law with the people, the, the text says that they taught and aided the people in understanding it. You know what they were doing? They were theologizing with them. They didn't just read the text and say, good luck with that. They talked with the people about what it said, what it meant. Titus chapter 2. The older are to teach the younger 
the older have gained some experience and practically how to live God's ways. Share that with the younger. God talk. Talk about it. Parents and children, whether it's Old Testament, classic text about talking with your children in the way, when you rise up, when you lie down. To Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, parents, raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We don't hand our kid a Bible on their 12th birthday because that's the age of accountability. And say, all right, kid, you're on the clock now. You're, you're responsible for this. We talk with them about it. We God talk with them about it. We share what we've learned in our understanding. But we need to always remember, as necessary as that is, that's still one step removed from the text itself. Well, ultimately, what we're trying to do is to model for our kids the fact that they need to learn to read and wrestle with Scripture for themselves. We need to remember, too, that God's order for the church in Ephesians chapter 4, for all its familiarity, think about what Paul is saying when, when he wrote that, that God in, in Christ gave to the church some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service and the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Paul and God through Paul did not say, and he gave us his word, and that's all you need as such. He, all, he said that part of what he gives the church is apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Uh, some of those are still with us today. We call them shepherds. We call them elders. And we have preachers and evangelists. God's gifts to the church, people who continue to talk with us about Scripture. The word of God is sufficient, but God always intends us for to talk with us about it. And to the fact, to that end, he gave as gifts to the church, roles in the church of people who would do this and lead this. The path to maturity, Paul says, is in the roles for people that God has given the church, like elders and evangelists. And so we begin to remember that the Ethiopian eunuch's question in Acts chapter 8, when God sends Philip miraculously to him, remember that God wanted Philip to be there for him. And he asked the eunuch, what are you reading? He said, Isaiah, uh, do you understand it? How can I unless someone guides me? See, you're not the first one who thinks Isaiah is hard. God intended for us to talk with each other, to learn from others who have studied, but never to give it a, a, an authority that it should not have. And so informal theology is a feature, not a bug, of God's plan. This is how God's always set it up. And despite our American individualism, despite our, our bootstrap approach, the idea that, you know, we'll give the Bible, somebody can pick up the Bible and read it and know how to be saved, I think that's technically true. But I don't think that God intended for that to be the normative way, the normal way, that people are going to come to a saving faith. There's going to be Phillips in their road. There are going to be mothers and fathers who teach them. There are going to be co-workers who took the risk to tell them the truth about ultimate reality. That was what God intended to be the normal way, was people talking to other people about him. And so at some level, I do think we get that. That's why we have Bible classes on Sunday. And that's why we have lectureships in Florida in February. So we can talk with each other about these things. And so we don't have to be averse uh, to the tools that God has given us. We don't have to be averse to commentaries and sermons and things like this. We just need to be careful. And I might add, as as a sidebar, I, I, I don't think we need to be completely averse to reading some of the historical theological works either. If for no other reason than the point C.S. Lewis made, and I put the, a long quote in the book along that line in his famous essay on the reading of old books, that ultimately, even when you disagree with old books and old works, because they come from a different time and a different place, they interpret you too. And they show us our blind spots that we don't see in our cultural captivity sometimes. And it reminds us that there are parts of the Bible that we haven't read, or there are ways of thinking about parts of the Bible that we haven't thought about. Because we're stuck in our own ruts and our own inherited ways of thinking, whether we realize it or not sometimes. In fact, systematic categories, for all the flaws of systematic theology as such, when it's formalized, systematic categories, the classic systematic categories, still, I think, show us or remind us that there are areas that, uh, that the Bible talks about that, frankly, we don't talk that much about. Uh, put, put it this way, when you stop and think about it, when, when we think about what makes us distinct... And we think about, well, baptism for the forgiveness of sins. That's how you're saved. Or we think about local congregational autonomy. 
Now that, that sets us apart. Or we think about no instrumental music. That, that sets us apart. Now, when we stop and think about it, uh, baptism and forgiveness of sins is just one small part of soteriology, how God saves us. And, and, and no instrumental music, local congregational autonomy, those are just a couple of facets of ecclesiology, what it means to be, in, be the church and, and to live before God as the church. Frankly, we, we don't do a whole lot serious thought about the Holy Spirit. We don't do a whole lot with eschatology, really wrestling with what it means that we're not going to be going to heaven, uh, you know, angels on a cloud with halos. We're going to be raised from the dead. I think if you're honest and you stop to think about it, a lot of us begin to realize we're not actually nearly as shaped by the Bible's message about the end as we think. We're shaped more by the cultures because sometimes in my experience, when I start pushing people about, it's not so much about going to heaven when you die, it's about waiting for Jesus to come back when the resurrection happens. Thus the early Christians, Lord, come quickly. We forget that sometimes. And so, so systematic theology reminds us there are whole swaths of the Bible that we haven't thought enough about. We haven't wrestled deeply enough with. And so what I want to do, what I want to do in, in, in the balance of the time that I have left, is I want to make uh, just a few practical observations about systemization. Necessary, but dangerous. I'm going to make four quick observations about systemization, because it is necessary, and we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past and become Church of Christers, like the Calvinists, or other groups. Number one, I think we need to be aware of how we teach our children. I think we need to be aware of how we teach our children. If our children know what we believe and how to argue with their denominational friends at school only from proof texts alone, then what we've done is we've given them the system and not Scripture. We've given them the five points of salvation and proof text. I listen, I, I believe in the five points of salvation, the three works of the church. I, I, I'm, I'm orthodox. But when we think we've done our job, because we gave our kids a list of passages, one verse at a time, one shot hits, or one verse, you know, quick shots, that we have given them the breadth and the depth of Scripture. We're passing on the system more than we realize. See, when I, when I was in math class growing up, there were teachers in math class who didn't want you just to get the answer to the complicated problem right. They wanted you to show your work because they wanted to see how you got the answer that you did. Because, and, and I, maybe you had a math teacher like this too somewhere along the way, you would be marked wrong even if the answer was correct, but the procedure was wrong. They'd still mark you off. Because the math teacher didn't want to accept this truth then, but the math teachers understood that process is as important as correct answer. How you get the answer matters because you might be right sometimes, but eventually if you're using the wrong method, the wrong process, it's going to catch up with you. You're going to become an engineer whose rockets blow up. And so it goes with teaching our children about God and about Scripture. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, if, if, you're, if your grandchildren know all our stock phrases, they can pray good prayers about the preacher having a ready recollection and guard, guide, and direct it. <laughs> And they can speak about local congregational autonomy, and we are non-institutional and non-instrumental. They know the terminology. They know the vocabulary. They know these things as what we do. But let me ask you something. How well can they ground these things in scriptures beyond proof texts, beyond the tradition that we have given them? I remember one time years ago, someone came up to me once after services, and they said to me, they said to me, where's that verse that says instrumental music is wrong? They knew what we believed. But they hadn't really learned how Scripture teaches it. They just knew what our system was. They were framing the question in terms of our soft systematic theology, not from a mindset shaped by command and example and necessary inference, not by a mind trained to reason from Scripture. They just knew what we believed, and they needed the proof text. We need to be aware of how we're teaching our children. If all we're doing is teaching our teens proof texted morality on teen issues, no sex, no drinking, no drugs, that's fine, but that's only going to get us so far. And frankly, as I've heard more and more, especially in the past year or so in conversations, more and more churches and preachers and elders concerned about how many teens they're losing as they leave home and as they go off to college, especially if it's not Florida college. 
We need to be aware that part of the problem is we're maybe pounding teen issues so much with proof texts. We're teaching them the system. We need to be teaching them just as much as those issues, a deeper relationship with Scripture itself, teaching them how to read Scripture for themselves rather than just knowing what the stock pat answers are, not just how to use Scripture as an accidental energy of proof text for the work of the church or moral issues. Otherwise, what happens is they leave our homes, they leave our congregations with a list of rules, but not a view of life or a substantive relationship that's based upon God and a relationship with him. We need to be careful that what we're not, in fact, doing is teaching the system, that we're not frogs in a boiling pot. Number two. Number two, we, we need to put our systemization in the context. It's necessary. It's how we're going to derive our teaching on baptism or the church or any of our other uh, whipping boys this morning. There is a place for saying that baptism is necessary on the basis of Acts 2.38 or Romans 6 or 1 Peter 3. However, there is a also go beyond that propositional statement and ground something like baptism in the Bible's larger narrative in its presentation. That baptism makes sense not just because God said you had to. That's true enough. But baptism makes sense because God has always had a ritual of consecration to his work. God has always had a ritual that cleanses and purifies and makes something holy for his use. Or we switch metaphors. That's more Levitical terminology. What about, what about kingdom terminology? To be a citizen of the kingdom requires to be born into it. I mean, that's how we became American citizens, right? I mean, there's a few who will be naturalized. But generally, how do you become a citizen of anything? You're born into it. You're baptized into it. New life, new citizenship requires a new kind of birth. We, in, we, we take the teaching and we sit more deeply into Scripture's own thought world and language rather than just, here's your proof text at point number five and how to be saved, Acts 2.38. And I'll tell you, this is important to understand, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, because in our context for the coming generation, our children and grandchildren, narrative is necessary for them to make sense of things. I think we're about to find out how much we've been piggybacking off of the Judeo-Christian foundation of our culture now that it's gone. Our next generation has such a gap from most of us who are, say, 40 and over. That's hard for us to understand. I remember a few years ago, one of the high school kids back home to me said, Mr. Wilson, it's really hard at school. He's a high school student. I said, well, what's going on? Talk to me about it. He said, all the cool kids are gay. That's a world you and I can't, can't imagine. When I was growing up, it shouldn't have been done, but those were the kids who were mocked, and they were the end of jokes. And now that's the in crowd that you are pressured to aspire to. It's a world we don't understand, many of us. It's hard for us to get our minds right if you're 40 and over. What kids who grew up with the internet, and with the end fruit of the sexual revolution, and with smartphones in their pocket, the world available 24-7, 365, often unmonitored by moms and dads. We're about to find out, I think, how much we've been piggybacking off of the culture rather than truly grounding ourselves and the generations after us in Scripture. And part of the change in the culture means that we're going to have to ground some of our arguments differently. Propositional, logical, rational appeals are not going to have the same effectiveness anymore. We need to be aware of how we systematize. Without the Bible's acknowledged authority, even for our children who are swimming in this and absorbing this, whether we like it or not, we're going to have to go deeper in a world that no longer even acknowledges the Bible's authority. Used to be we, we, we argued with our friends about what the Bible meant. Now we argue with our friends about why to listen to the Bible at all. And in that world, we're going to have to go deeper than just telling our young people, the Bible says homosexuality is a sin. That's true, but that's a systemic answer. Here's, it's a sin, and here's your proof text. We're going to have to take our young people and not just show, remind them that God, in God's authority it's a sin, but we're going to have to go and do a little bit more work with our young people than that. We're going to have to show them how the teaching in the Bible about homosexuality is grounded in the Bible's view of creation. We're going to start telling them, reminding them of the stories, making connection. Male and female, that was the complementarity that God intended when he made human beings in his image. We're going to have to go back and have to really work with them how the Bible shows that marriage is a metaphor for God's relationship with his people. Two different types of beings, again, coming together. That's what makes marriage work. Two unlike things coming together. It's not going to be enough to just tell them because God said so because our kids don't think in those terms anymore. They've got to have the truth of God connected into a different, or into the story more deeply. If we proof text with our kids, we're going to lose a lot of our kids, I'm afraid. <laughs> 
Because I don't know that we're going to change the world's mind, even if we do deepen our argument, how we systematize, how we argue and, and make the case from Scripture about these things. But I do think that part of how we're going to be able to keep more of our young people in the times ahead is by inviting our young people more deeply into the Bible's own thought world. They live in the story. Its own metaphysical view of reality becomes theirs. Number three, uh, let, me, let me say just a word. Number three, when it comes to, to systematization, inevitable, but, 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 but to be done cautiously. Number three, uh, the risks of topical preaching. Topical preaching is systematic preaching. That's what it is. It's easy to do because you just take a concordance out, or you look up and you look up your word, or you grab your knaves off the shelf, and I'm showing my age in that. All the young people are saying that's what logos and Bible works are for. But you do, you, you, you take a reference work, you find some passages that are you know, already kind of put together for you, and there's your easy sermon, especially for young inexperienced preachers. That's why young inexperienced preachers like to preach topically. It's a scriptural version of just add water. We think textual preaching is hard for young men just starting out because the text forces discipline. It limits the horizon of the sermon. They may not be able or ready to develop a sermon out of one text. I think this sort of thinking is wrong and dangerous. And here's why. In reality, what too many topical sermons, and I say this about my own as much as anybody else's, are, in reality, is really bad systemizations, bad systematic theologies, bad and tenditious connections between texts, sometimes doing violence to the context. We need to encourage our younger men to learn to preach textually well because actually the reality is correctly understood. Topical preaching is much, much more difficult to do rightly and well than textual preaching because proper topical preaching takes a great amount of knowledge, maturity, experience, and judgment to do it in a way that does justice to the texts that are being connected. When you look at how the apostolic preaching and writing in the New Testament works, where, where these men were connecting uh, passages around from all over. It was, it was topical in many ways. But when you look very closely at what the apostles were actually doing and the passages that they pulled and associated with each other in their writings, what you'll learn is that they were not proof texting. They were extremely sophisticated in what passages they chose, what lines they cited, what they alluded to. And generally speaking, when they pulled a passage in, they were pulling not just a line, but the entire context. And they expected their readers to know that. We're just not as biblically literate as some of the early Christians were anymore, to be honest. And so we miss even some of what the apostles are doing. <clears throat> They're not simplistically proof texting. This is quality topical preaching. We preach topically because that's what's wanted. The temptation to seek gift-wrapped answers. That's what, our, that's what our people want. Rather than wisdom and understanding. We want simple answers. Just get to the point. We are the people of the executive summary. Just tell me what I have to do to be saved. Everything else is water under the bridge. Sometimes we're not nearly as interested in, in thinking God's thoughts after him, learning to see the world his way. And we think we're helping sometimes when we ask this of our preachers or when we as preachers give this to our people. We think we're helping people, especially our young. But I think all we're really doing with, with, with poor topical preaching is really just bad systematic theology. All we're really doing is putting short-term band-aids on long-term deficiencies. I'm convinced, as I slide into my third decade of full-time work, that a steady diet of mostly topical preaching done through simplistic proof texting will rarely produce a broad-based maturity in a congregation. Because maturity is not just pat answers. Maturity is a mindset. It's a way of thinking. It's being able to discern not just between right and wrong, but between wisdom and foolishness. See, too often, even again in our people, the question is, is something wrong? That's not the best question. The best question is, is something right? If you're pursuing what's right, you'll never have to worry about being what's wrong in one sense. And even better than that is, choose what's wise, biblically speaking. If you're pursuing what's biblically wise, you'll never have to worry either. But that's hard to get across when you're just proof texting your way through the Bible. There is, to be sure, a place and a need for topical preaching. 
But I do think we need to stay balanced with the textual as well as be aware of the extra effort it does take to do topical preaching well, lest we slowly become caretakers of the system without even realizing it. And number four, fourthly and finally, uh, I think we need to also make sure that we are making every effort to read and to preach the Bible the way it was given as often as possible. For some of us, that will mean a recovery of balance. But the reality is God gave us 66 books. It's not like the Babylonian Talmud where there are tractates on different subjects. 66 books, it's all integrated together. When was the last time you read a whole book of the Bible through in one sitting and Philemon doesn't count? <laughs> we have four hours to binge watch several episodes on Netflix but not three hours to sit down and read Romans in one sitting. If you haven't done it or you haven't done it in a while, do, do it. It will change things for you. Do it regularly. And preaching, maybe sometimes we need to take the risk of preaching whole books, a series through whole books, rather than a series that's usually topically based. Above all, we need to quit chasing relevance. Why does the world's headlines get to set the agenda for the church and what it's going to talk about? I'm not saying we never respond to current events. But letting the latest internet meme set Sunday's agenda on a regular basis is not a solid method of using the Bible well. We need to read the Bible long way through, the way God gave it to us, and have the conversation that God wants to have. His books, his topics, his emphases. And we need to use that discipline in our reading, in our preaching, in our teaching to remind us that so much of what is going on in the world is just noise. And if we would cut out the noise, cut back on the TV, go on a fast from social media, remember when you'd be amazed how little you miss it, how much better you feel about yourself and your life rather than the envy and the jealousy and the covetousness that eats at us. But you'd also begin to realize if you take that extra time and spend it in God's word, how silly and shallow and empty it all is. Have the conversation God wants to have. His books read his way on his terms. Stay focused on the eternal truths about God, human nature, the sins that so easily ensnares us. It's interesting. I was recently looking through some of my files of sermons from about 8 to 10 years ago. I was going through some stuff. And I was stunned as I was looking through my old sermon notes about some things. How much the political, financial, and natural disaster news was pretty much the same 8 to 10 years ago as it is now. See, I thought I was being relevant. We need to be much less driven by the news cycle, even in the church. Systemization is, to some point, both necessary and unavoidable, but it needs to be disciplined by the Bible in ways that are easily lost sight of. And again, I can't help but think that so much of the growing biblical illiteracy that some of us are noticing and are concerned about in our congregations, and especially among our young people, to be sure, it's partially, you know, it's a parent's responsibility, I get that, and too much technology, distraction, screen time, I get that. But I also think it's the fact that we are quite often not as seriously textual people anymore. We are more topical than we realize. And so we need to be aware of the topical temptation to have doctrine without Scripture and Scripture's depth. And so in conclusion, as I bring us to a close this morning, the lesson from history is this for us. Even those who wrote patristic theology into early systematic theology, it's interesting when you actually go back and look at what they wrote, not the caricatures that we have of them of bad guys in church history, but when you actually look at what they wrote for yourself, it's interesting how often they pointed back to the text as the final authority. You start with something as early as what we call the sub-apostolic fathers, Clement, who's writing all oh, about the time the apostle John dies. He's a contemporary of the apostles. And he writes a letter to the church in Corinth. He's in Rome. Writes a letter to the church in Corinth. It's called First Clement. And it's interesting. He says this. He says, verse 40, or chapter 47 of his work, take up the epistle of that blessed apostle Paul. What did he write to you at first, at the beginning of his proclamation of the gospel? To be sure he sent you a letter in the spirit concerning himself and Cephas and Apollos, since you were even engaged in partisanship. What's Clement doing? Here's my theology for what you need. I ain't saying go back and read your Bible, folks. 
Ignatius, a little bit later to the very, very early 2nd century, Ignatius writes a letter to Rome, chapter 4 of his epistle to the Romans. He says this, he says, I am not enjoining you as Peter and Paul did. They were apostles. I'm condemned. These guys weren't tap dancing on the authority of the Bible. All right, the apostles are dead. Let's have a Catholic church now. Let's lay the foundation for something great. Now that those guys are out of the way. It happened slowly. It happened gradually over time. It often happened because the people who came behind them ascribed authority to their words that they themselves did not. And it's not their fault their works were abused. The earliest Christian writers understood they were not apostles. And that their writing was not on par with apostolic writing, as useful as it could be for the people of that time and that place. And if carefully and critically read, sometimes even still for us today. But I want to leave you this morning with one last paragraph from, of all people, John Calvin. Uh, uh, the great uh, specter of systematic theology gone amok in our day and time. Let me read you a paragraph from the beginning of his Institutes of the Christian Religion, if I may, to close this morning. This is what Calvin wrote. He said, and since we are bound to acknowledge that all truth and sound doctrine proceed from God, doesn't sound like much of a Calvinist, I will venture boldly to declare what I think of this work, acknowledging it to be God's work rather than mine. He's talking about his own writing. To him, indeed, the praise due it must be ascribed. My opinion of this work, then, is this. I exhort all who reverence the word of the Lord to read it and diligently imprint it on their memory if they would, in the first place, have a summary of Christian doctrine, and in the second place, an introduction of the profitable reading both of the Old and New Testament. In other words, he wrote that to help people read their Bibles better. He didn't start out to create a system to take over. When they shall have done so, they will know by experience that I have not wished to impose upon them with words. Catch that. I'm not writing authoritatively, he says. Should anyone be unable to comprehend all that is contained within Scripture, he must not, however, give up in despair, but continue always to read on. Not refer back to page 522. Continue on, hoping that one passage will give a more familiar exposition of another. Keep reading Scripture, is what Calvin says. Above all things, I would recommend that recourse be had to Scripture and considering the proofs which I adduce from it. In other words, John Calvin didn't set out to create Calvinism as we know it. Later readers ascribed weight to his words that he himself did not and even disavowed. Such is also the stuff of church history. And it's not the men we blame often, it's their successors who are to be blamed for what becomes of their work, their words, their legacy. If people, from the men who immediately followed the apostles to John Calvin himself, if these people were intentionally trying to be scripture-based, and yet we know and can see clearly how Calvin does beget Calvinism eventually, then the warning for us is how much more can we end up emulating this ourselves unaware over time. When our, kids grow, when our kids know that we get baptized, but not why we get baptized, when they can't explain it to themselves from the text, there's a problem. When we can't teach the gospel to our neighbors, even though we ourselves have obeyed the gospel, we can't even give a basic account of what God wants. We need to get our preacher, one of the elders, to help us with that. You know, we've been a Christian for 20 years. There's a problem. Whether we realize or not, brethren, then we begin to collectively, if not always individually, become defined by an adherence to a received and historical tradition. This is just what we do. Even if that system and historical tradition is correct about things like baptism, doctrinally correct, functionally wrong. And if that becomes the case for us, we have failed. And we may have restored the doctrinal content of New Testament Christianity, but we have not restored the spirit of New Testament Christianity. And if that is the case, or if that becomes the case for us, then it is no wonder why in the third and fourth generation, so to speak, we begin to see our own young people fail to make their faith their own. Because to them it's not a living faith, but a passed on system. Because the authority 
for what they believe and what they've grown up practicing is not scripture, but their parents, their preachers, the elders, the congregational culture, and the peer pressure of the folks in the pews. And when they leave that community, they leave that system behind because it was never a true faith to them. May God help us to use this awareness of history to recognize both the necessary reality of systematizing the Bible's teaching sometimes, but also the danger of, of how systematization slowly over time becomes an in and of itself often unawares to the people who are doing it. Thanks for your time. Yes, sir.